Welcome to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. The PAS Report provides an honest analysis on the critical issues that matter to you without the biased media filters. Here's your host, Professor Nicholas Giordano. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the PAS Report Podcast. This is your host, Nick Giordano. It's been a crazy weekend. I'm sure everyone has seen or heard about the attempted coup that was taking place in Russia against of Vladimir Putin and the Russian military. You had a mercenary group, the Wagner Group, that Russia is actually using in Ukraine, and, and there's bitterness, there's resentment. They're not satisfied with their strategy, so ultimately they turn their guns on Russia, and we're actually marching towards Moscow. A deal was brokered, the coup ended, and the, the leader of the Wagner Group, I can't recall his name off the top of my head, but he was exiled. So it, it's a crazy world. And it was interesting to see the reaction here in the United States because you had a lot of people that were cheering this on. But people don't realize. They, they see the hearing now. They, they don't look deeper. Okay, Putin, yeah, he may be a monster. And Putin is someone that certainly is an international pariah. But be careful what you wish for because you do not want to see instability in a country that has over 6,500 nuclear bombs. You do not want to see that type of, that level of instability. You do not want to see the desperation grow in Vladimir Putin. You don't know who's coming in next. And that's the problem. It's American foreign policy at its finest. And this is why America has become a place where we're all short-term thinkers. We only think about the here and now. We don't look at a year down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road. The next person that comes in behind Putin can actually be worse. And if Putin really is boxed into a corner where his own people are turning on him, where his own administration's turning on him, well, what are the chances that maybe that desperation will lead to a nuclear strike? So people need to really start thinking, cooler heads need to prevail, we need to tamp down the rhetoric and see how this all plays out. With that being said... This is why you don't fight wars using mercenary groups, because mercenary groups, the loyalty is to themselves and the money they're making. It's not necessarily to the survival of a nation. I mean, let's be honest here. There's only two reasons that Ukraine has been able to put up a fight against Russia. The first reason is because of the enormous amount of money and military equipment that we've given them. The, the second reason is because of Ukrainian nationalism. They have something to fight for. And that is what is driving them. So I'm just saying everyone needs to cool down. I wish we had real leadership in place, leadership that would actually broker an end to hostilities. This way we could see some semblance of stability be reintroduced into the international system. Because as instability grows and as this continues to go on, uh, to me, and I've said this before, it's only going to get worse. However, I don't want to harp on it. Make sure you go to PAS Report website, PASReport.com. Sign up for the newsletter there. Also, make sure to follow and subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And you don't miss the great guests that I have on because I have a fantastic guest lined up for today. He's been on the show before. I always love to get his thoughts. I, always, I value his thoughts. He is someone that calls it as he sees it. He's a defender of the Constitution. I'm bringing on Professor John Yu. He is back. He and Robert Del Hunte, they have a brand new book out, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court. It is a great read. There are so many misconceptions about the Supreme Court, and that's why people should check out this book. John is a law professor at UC Berkeley, and he's like a machine. He has over 100 articles in the academic journals. He writes editorials all the time, and I believe this is actually his 11th book. I mean, I'm still working on my first one. He's on number 11. He, he served in all three branches of government, has enormous institutional knowledge. He is someone that really understands the concept of federalism and the importance of the Constitution. John, always a pleasure to have you on the program. How are you today? Good, good. How you doing? I'm doing well, and I'm glad you could be here because your new book, it deals with a lot of the misconceptions that people have with the Supreme Court. So starting off, what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about the Supreme Court? Maybe a lot of our fellow citizens make the mistake of thinking that the Supreme Court is a group of philosopher kings and queens who are there to decide the most important issues of life for us. You know, look at the response, and we spend a whole chapter in the book on this, about Dobbs, the case that reversed Roe versus Wade last year and returned abortion to the states for a decision. You had people in the Congress, in the elected legislatures, governors, and even the president of the United States who said, no, no, don't let us decide the issue of abortion through democratic means. 
we just want five out of nine people at the Supreme Court to decide this fundamental question of when does life begin for the whole country? And I think there's probably about 50% of the country who thinks that's a good idea rather than right, having things decided through negotiation, compromise, debate, and elections like we decide everything else. So you've seen over the last 30, 40 years, more and more important issues go to the Supreme Court for decision. And every time they do that, they take the decision out of the hands of the democratic process. Now, that doesn't mean that democracy gets to decide everything. You know, our, another political, uh, incorrect, politically incorrect thing to say is that we don't live in a democracy. <laughs> we live in a republic. And the republic is designed to make things slow. It's designed not to allow every issue up for democratic debate. But in general, when something is not protected in the text of the Constitution, our system leaves it up to either the state legislatures and governors, state courts sometimes, but sometimes to Congress, but not just up to five out of nine justices. It's such an important point because, you know, when I read the Dobbs decision, I was like, oh, wow, it's federalism. It's the actual mm -hmm. system of federalism at play. And then you have all these people outraged about it. And it's clear that many of them, including elected members of Congress, don't really understand what federalism is, or they simply don't care. Now, mm -hmm. in your book, you bring up the question, Alexander Hamilton looked at the, the judicial branch of government as the least dangerous branch of government. And part of it was because it was going to be the weakest branch of government. They did recognize that. Why do we continually teach that we have three co-equal branches of government when that was never true, just like we're not a real democracy as people pretend out there. But the Supreme Court has gained an enormous amount of power. So can, can you explain that to the audience? Well, first, I, I got to give you points for correctly citing the Federal's papers and Alexander Hamilton and quoting. I, I hope the students are listening. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I hope mine are too. Uh, but the second point is, you're quite right. The uh, Federal's papers, nor the, neither the Federal's nor the Constitution create a government where each of the three branches are equally powerful. That's not what they meant. They meant that the three branches have different jobs and that they are relatively independent of each other when they do those jobs. Right? The Congress passes the laws, although we can talk later about how this whole system has been distorted and changed. <laughs> and the president is supposed to enforce those laws. You're supposed to prosecute people who violate the law. And the courts decide the cases under those laws, decides disputes under those laws. None of those three branches are superior to each other. Um, they just have different functions. Uh, and what Hamilton was saying in that least dangerous branch, quote from Federalist Number 78, his observation was of those three branches, the judiciary should be weakest. So he said, Congress has a power of will, right? They represent the will of the community. They pass the laws. Then they said, the president, he has the sword. He has the ability to compel because he is the, the force of the community. And he said, what does the judiciary have? They're the least dangerous. He said that all they have is judgment. All they get to do is interpret and judge. But if the other two branches don't agree with the court, they're the weakest branch. They can do a lot to frustrate. The court has no armies. The court doesn't have the purse. All the court can do is persuade us. Realistically, th throughout our history, it was that the, the court almost operates on a moral high ground, a higher level, we'll say, than Congress and the presidency. So they serve as, as almost like this moral authority within our society. But you're right. They can be ignored. I mean, just look at Andrew Jackson. <laughs> President Andrew Jackson uh, ignored him. Abraham Martin, Lincoln. Right? Correct. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Absolutely. But what we've seen recently, and something that's concerned me for a, a long time, I, you know, I, I look at it as over the last... 40, 50 years, I think the Supreme Court has provided the government with way too much deference over some of our fundamental rights, like speech, like privacy. Do you think that the court has become much more of an activist court over the last 40, 50 years, moved away from the idea of originalism and judicial restraint? So I think it's a great question. I think the court... Uh, has deviated from the original understanding of the Constitution for a long time, almost 100 years. So while you have originalist justices, say like Justice Scalia, the most prominent one, or the one on the court now is most prominent is Justice Thomas. Uh, I clerked for him. These, these 
originalist justices have not had a majority on the court since 1937. So it's been almost it's been 90 years now since uh, you've had an approach to the Supreme to the Constitution that's more about policy, more what makes good sense, more uh, that indulges the preferences and the wishes of the justices. And so I don't think uh, I think we're only la- now in just the last few years with the three Trump justices, uh, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and, and Coney Barrett, actually seeing a return to the kind of originalism, which I think was really the way you're supposed to interpret the Constitution. We've been in this long period where the court's been relatively unrestrained in how interprets it. And the reason why, let me tell you, it's, it's because of progressivism, because when the new Great Depression happened, FDR put into effect a new deal, which frankly had a lot of socialist elements to it, a lot of government running the economy. For example, the government could set the prices and the levels of production for everything in the the economy during the New Deal. The the Supreme Court said that's not consistent with the Bill of Rights. It's not consistent with individual liberty for the government to manage all of our lives that way. I think that was true to the original understanding. FDR said, well, if you do that, I'm going to pack the court. I'm going to add six new members to the court and the Supreme Court back down. And ever since then, we have been living in this uh, relative period of freewheeling interpretation to the Constitution. So my hope is that we are starting to see the return of what you mentioned before, federalism. We're starting to see the return of a real separation of powers, and we're starting to see a return to originalism. Hopefully, that will lead to an end of what I think you're referring to, which is this period where the courts would let the government have its way with individual rights. Let the court, let the government decide to balance individual rights against other needs. Yeah, And uh, I don't think that's true to the original constitution. I, I completely agree with that. But you just brought up something that you actually bring up in your book too. It's the idea of packing the court, right? So for the first time, like you said, <laughs> since 1937, we have a Supreme Court that actually looks at the constitution and, and tries to interpret it in, in the way that it was written as opposed to modern day. When you look at our constitution, it's something I find remarkable because I always hear people say the constitution's old and outdated. And I get students that when I bring up the constitution, we talk about it. They say, well, that was a document written 230 years ago. So I always challenge them. Okay, well, what would you change in the constitution? Uh, And they can't really recite anything specific in the constitution. I'm like, well, if you're tweaking articles one through three, understand that you're tweaking with the checks and balances and separation of powers. If you tweak article four, well, that's tweaking the states and the interaction between the feds and the state. Uh, but they never bring up anything specific. But we do hear a lot of this idea of packing the court. Now that we have judges that rule in ways that some people may not like, they say, well, let's just add more Supreme Court justices. Why is that idea you know just why? completely yeah. ridiculous and ludicrous? I, I, I know. I, I, got, I anticipate your question because the question is why. And so uh, in the book, we tried to trace how attacks on the court are linked to progressivism, to the rise of progressive government. So the way to think of it, I guess, may be put this way. If you know the ultimate good for society and all mankind Why would you let the Supreme Court stand in your way? Why would you let the separation of power stand in your way? Why let federalism and the Constitution stand in your way? And that really is what you see in progressivism in the New Deal under LBJ in the 60s. And then Biden, I mean, I think Biden campaigned as a moderate, but then I think what happened politically is he let the far left of his party run things. And they think they know, they think they have the ultimate answer for everything. And if you think you do, then you're going to be really frustrated by things like the filibuster and the Senate and the fact that legislation takes so long and that there's a Supreme Court that judges the constitutionality of those laws because they all slow things down from the achievement of utopia on earth. And so I think we see it when progressivism rises. You see these attacks on the institutions, which are meant to make sure we know what we're doing. I mean, this is the... the uh, This is the quandary that bedeviled the founders and led to our constitution is they knew that all source of power in our country stems from the consent of the people. But they also know that the people can do passionate, irrational things, right? You don't, none of us wants to be ruled by 50.1% of the population on all questions all the time. We make mistakes. The people make mistakes. The people become enamored of things that are not good for them. The people make misjudgments just like everybody does. So the constitution is meant to slow us down to make sure we know what we're doing, 
to make sure we don't make mistakes as often as if we rushed into things. But that's what progressivism wants. They want us to rush into things. And they've distorted the idea of a constitutional republic. I mean, I constantly hear this idea of the will of the people, that the will of the people must prevail. And I have to remind my students that the majority of the South supported slavery and the concept of slavery. So should the will of the people have prevailed there? And so you're right to point that out, that it's not always about a, a majority. Unfortunately, we, we've slipped in and you're in the education system now. You know, you teach over at uh, UC Berkeley. Why has the mindset of the student body changed? Why don't they understand or really know America? I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious what you think, too, about this. I have noticed that uh, over time, uh, students and, and this faculty, too, uh, know less and less Without about American history. Yeah, American institutions, American history. I think they're hard pressed to explain why there was an American revolution and what the, you know, the different uh, the, the agenda behind the Constitution were. Um, I I think I see students coming out of our high schools with very little knowledge of civics and uh, basic uh, basic knowledge of our of our government. I think so. I think some of it has to do. I think this idea of woke is a bad shorthand. I understand it's a shorthand, but I think what has happened is uh, I don't mean Marxism in a bad way. I just descriptively I think Mar Marxist thought has really penetrated not just graduate school and colleges, it seeped its way into high school teachers, middle school teachers, and Marxist thought, Marxist history, sees everything just as a quest for wealth and power. So they see the constitution, they see the revolution, not as, I think as you're suggesting you see it, and I see it as a desire for greater individual freedom and liberty and perfecting the union. They just see the revolution and the constitution as one class oppressing another class. And just the ways that these these events happen to oppress some at the expense of others. I don't think that's actually the American story. But if you believe that, then you don't want to have anything to do with the Constitution or the Revolution or our institutions because they're all instruments of oppression. Now, one last thing. I think we can look at other countries that believe this too. French Revolution, Russian Revolution. Chinese revolutions, these were all different from our revolution. These were all revolutions that said, destroy the past, get rid of tradition, replace it with a completely new system where we're going to perfect man. And look what happened in those Didn't places. work out too well for them. <laughs> no, they didn't work out well. Our revolution is a backwards looking revolution, right? They look at the original principles of liberty and freedom. And then the president, the Congress, and the Supreme Court are supposed to be working to protect. They're actually supposed to be competing with each other to protect our individual liberties. That's the founding design. It really is. And it's disheartening when we see what's happening in the United States. Now, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, I'm going to let you take a swipe at one of your competitors out there. And I, I want to get your thoughts on what we're seeing as far as student behaviors and even institutional behaviors. So hang tight, everyone. We'll be right back. PAS Report listeners, hurricane season is almost here and the time to prepare is right now, not when the hurricane hits. When Hurricane Ida hit the Gulf Coast, it destroyed countless homes and left many without access to food and clean water. Millions lost power, some for weeks. The floods that followed the hurricane washed out roads, made it impossible for grocery stores to restock their shelves. Families were desperate. They were waiting for help that was slow to arrive. But what if you didn't have to rely on FEMA to provide for your family during a crisis? The answer is simple. Be prepared with emergency food kits from 4Patriots. They're long-lasting and delicious food options are specifically designed to provide you and your loved ones with the sustenance you need when you need it most. And these food kits are hand-packed in the USA, last up to 25 years, compact inside covert storage totes, include a wide variety of delicious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, and they're backed by thousands of five-star customer reviews. For Patriots, survival food is not just for natural disasters. In today's world of uncertain supply chains and unpredictable emergencies, it's more important than ever to have a backup plan, whether it's temporary power outage, a winter blizzard, rising food costs, you can rest easy knowing that you have a reliable source source of food to see you through. And right now, you go to 4 use code PAS to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including the emergency food supply kits that are designed to last up to 25 years. Just go to 4 use code PAS to get 10% off your first purchase of 4 Patriots survival food. Welcome back, everyone. So before the break, I was alluding for you to be able to take a swipe at one of your competitive schools out there. And... I want to bring up Stanford University because I think it epitomizes a lot. So we saw the reaction to the Fifth Circuit Court judge 
and how the students were shouting, they were trying to silence him, and then you had a dean, not a student, but a dean go on an eight-minute rant against the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals judge. And what has happened in educational institutions? I mean, you know, colleges and universities, they used to be the bedrock of debate, the, the bedrock of dialogue and speech. And now we see an entire generation that thinks that they have the right to just silence anyone that they disagree with. The changing mindset is astonishing. I just wrote a piece uh, that was published in Fox News about how 29% of young people from Gen Z wouldn't mind government cameras in people's homes. You have 50 1% that support the idea of socialism, 54% that despise capitalism, 61% want to see the First Amendment amended to ban offensive and hate speech, or what they deem as offensive and hate speech. They don't understand that whoever's in power will determine what hate and offensive speech is, and it may go against them. They may not like it when they see what it looks like when it's in effect. Do you think the court has played a role in not defending our God-given liberties enough? And what I mean by that is, do you think that they don't explain the importance of these God-given liberties, that the Constitution, especially with the Bill of Rights, is the vehicle, not of what we essentially can do, but it's a limit on what the government can do. So do you think the court hasn't really pushed that idea enough? So actually, I think the Supreme Court has been pretty good about speech. They have actually, they're actually, of, of uh, any of the institutions of government today, and I think the state governments too, I think the Supreme Court is the institution that's most protective of speech in our society. They are really running against the currents here. And I think it goes to these polls you're pointing to where a lot of people, again, are so convinced they know what is the ultimate best for all of us that they will subordinate everything to it. So uh, you, if you think money and politics is the problem, right, then you're going to try to limit money and politics and you'll subordinate free speech to that. Right, The Supreme Court struck that down in Citizens United. You know, Citizens United is not the terrible decision that sometimes made out to be by liberal academics or the press. It is a defense of free speech. It's a defense that and haven't the progressives have really benefit on the Citizen United? Yeah, I mean, they, actually, they make in the, far more yes. money than conservatives do. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you look at the actual consequences of free speech, it actually helped. Like I think unions pour way more money into elections than corporations do, hugely amount, a lot more. Is that? I mean, the, you know, but if you believe like the you know uh, leftist approach to the Supreme Court, they should have just voted to support corporations, right? And the, but actually, their decision actually helps unions. But I think that the so I, I this is, that actually Citizens United is a very good example of how this Supreme Court uh, struck down a law that was passed by large majorities of Congress. And signed by President George W. Bush, you know, a conservative Republican, and I think was supported in the opinion polls by a lot, you know, the large majority of the American people. But the courts still stood up for the First Amendment. It's a great point. And in your book, you talk about how the pendulum swings. Like, you know, there's times where the Supreme Court is not so great. <laughs> Other times where yeah. the Supreme <laughs> Court is great. There, there are certain Supreme Court justices that really uh, understand the philosophies that the founding fathers wanted to instill within society. There are other Supreme Court justices that are just simply mediocre, like other parts of our society. Uh, mm -hmm. when, when you were writing this book, was there any particular case that really that you really wanted to touch on in this book? Well, of course, the Dobbs case is uh, the most important case, I think, perhaps from a the perspectives we're talking about, the separation of powers, the proper role of the Supreme Court, federalism, you know, in, in rights. Uh, so we spent two chapters on Dobbs, not just the opinion, but the, if you remember the leak of the opinion beforehand, the effort to try to pressure the court to change its mind, assassination attempt on a Supreme Court. I mean, this has never happened before. Who would have thought in front of Supreme all this Court justices' homes, justice houses every day? I think those are still going on. And then the second case we talk about is the Bruin case, which is even though we think the court should get out of the job of making up rights, they ought to protect the ones that are right there in the text. I mean, the, you can have an argument about how broad the right to bear arms is, but it's the right is in the Constitution, it's in the Second Amendment, and the Supreme Court did not protect it until 2000-something. It's incredible. So we talk about how an originalist approach to the Constitution shows you that there was no right to abortion. Let the people decide that. But there are certain rights, free speech, but 
the Second Amendment, that they are there and ought to be protected. And then the third one that I bet most people have not heard about, which is I think going to be the signature issue of the Roberts Court in the end, is a case called West Virginia versus EPA, which had the effect of severely cutting back on the power of the agencies. And I think this is one where I would hope most Americans, if they understood what was going on, uh, would support the court, which is we uh, the, the progressive era, the New Deal, and then LBJ, and then Obama really put into place this huge government that's not elected, that's really not responsible to anybody, and which operates, as you said, with a lot of deference from the courts and actually everybody in the government. And they're allowed to interpret and adjust and modify and balance our rights. And so the court in, is starting this long, it's going to take a long time, but it's made a start on trying to break up the power of this gigantic government and subject to control of our elected representatives and the president and the courts. It's such a good point. And you also brought up this point when it came to the release uh, of the Durham report, that the the solution is a, a, a congressional remedy, that, that maybe these agencies have crossed the red line. They, they crossed the red line that they were never supposed to cross. And now it's time for Congress to start considering uh, removing some power and actually exercising their power of oversight over these agencies, because it appears to many people. I mean, you have uh, half the country that believes that the Department of Justice and the FBI has been politically weaponized. So can you just uh, quickly explain to the audience your thoughts on, on the Durham report and, and how Congress can offer a remedy to that problem? So one of the uh, difficult challenges of designing the Constitution that we're seeing expressed today is we do give a large amount of power to the president. And most of that comes through the president's power to enforce the law. And part of the issue is we know the, uh, the president can't enforce every law all the time. And so we give a lot of discretion to the FBI, to the attorney general and the Justice Department to decide what cases to pursue, what individuals to investigate, what powers. We've given them vast powers of surveillance, when to use those powers. A lot depends on how they do this, because I, I, I don't know what you think about this, but I've always been struck at how America is so exceptional in our voluntary compliance with the law. Almost all Americans, incredible numbers, file their taxes voluntarily on time and get it right. If we can understand them, those tax laws, <laughs> I mean, let me make that clear. I mean, we try our best, right? It's not our fault. I mean, the tax laws are so ridiculous and complicated. But most Americans, they want to support the police. Most Americans, you know, the police depend on voluntary cooperation. We call in tips when we see something wrong going on. Witnesses provide evidence to the voluntarily. This is not the way it is in the rest of the world. People don't realize how extraordinary it is, how much voluntary cooperation there is here with the police. But that depends on the government and law enforcement not doing their job in a politically biased way. And so if people see reports, as, as these reports are true, that the upper leadership of the FBI was biased against President Trump, they, they're the ones who took this Russia hoax, which I look, I was in the Justice Department. If I ever saw that Russia hoax, I would have laughed. I, I, there's no way I would have investigated this. Somehow they took this idea that Trump was in cahoots with the Russians, was just implausible on its face, and then turned it into a massive investigation that consumed the first two years of the Trump administration. If they see the Justice Department doing that, then they're going to start questioning whether our law enforcement agencies are free of bias. And if they're not persuaded of that, and they lose faith, faith in the integrity of our justice system, then the ability of our agencies to do their fundamental job, which is to enforce the laws, is going to be very, very difficult. That's the larger harm that's done by these FBI agents and Justice Department leaders who thought they were doing good by trying to pursue this Russia hoax investigation. Yeah, I think they did enormous damage, and not just with the Russia hoax, even before, you know, when you bring up Trump, everything gets so political. But even before that, the CIA spying on the Senate Intel Committee and then mm -hmm. the NSA's mm -hmm. prison program and the IRS. But as far as the former president goes, do you think that uh, he should have been charged under the Espionage Act? Or does the Presidential Records Act normally apply to presidents and former presidents? I still have so a I hard think, time seeing how the Espionage yeah. Act plays a role in the current charges. So, no, I mean, so frankly, I don't think the Presidential Records Act helps President Trump. 
I think actually the better argument is not necessarily one that gets can be made in the courtroom, uh, but is one that's made about constitutional principle outside the courtroom. And you know, when we look at the examples set by Washington or Hamilton or Lincoln, most of what they're talking about is the constitution as it applies outside the courts. And one of the most, I think, important principles we had for a long time was we don't prosecute former presidents. We rather we kind of leave them alone. And the reason for that is we want presidents, not for the past presidents we do this, we do that for the future presidents mm. so that they don't have to sit there when they make the most important decisions in the country thinking about, oh, am I going to get sued? Am I going to get prosecuted? We don't want them to think about their own personal vulnerability in the legal system when they decide about these really important decisions. And so because of that, we generally give a lot of space to presidents and we don't prosecute them even if they might have violated the law. So we've never prosecuted a former president before. Not even Nixon was prosecuted before. This is an amazing thing. Not even Jefferson Davis was prosecuted for being president of the Confederacy. If there's ever someone who should have been prosecuted, it was him. But we let it alone. We've also never prosecuted the candidate of the major opposition party for the presidency before. Put aside that Donald Trump was president, he's also leading in the polls right now over Joe Biden and any other Republican candidate. We've never prosecuted someone like that before because we don't want law enforcement to become a tool that's used to interfere with elections and to punish the losing party, even if there might have been crimes committed by candidates in the past. We have generally chosen not to use the great power of the government to interfere while an election was going on. And so those are two, I think, principles. They're not written in the Constitution. They're not something you could actually say in your defense in a courtroom. But I think those are the most important principles at stake here. Yeah, and I think you're right. Sometimes optics is more important than the courts. And I think that it's optically, it's really bad when you have a special counsel appointed for Biden uh, and, and his document case, and you're charging President Trump and the special counsel. I mean, Trump's investigation wrapped up in seven months and they got an indictment. That That's actually pretty fast for a special counsel. So when we look at it, we are living through certain bizarre times here in the United States. Last question. As far as the Supreme Court goes, do you, do you think that the Supreme Court, obviously, they don't want to get involved in the politics of the 2024 presidential election. However, with this case going on, with more cases maybe coming down the pike, not just against President, uh, former President Trump, but if we begin to see more and more evidence emerge against uh, current President Biden, do you think that some of these issues may go all the way up to the Supreme Court? During this election oh, cycle? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately so. Uh, if, For example, with uh, the prosecution against President Trump, he's going to raise certain defenses that are not factual, that are based on the law, and those could well go to the Supreme Court. For example, he has said that he declassified all these documents when he left. In fact, he said, by taking them to Mar-a-Lago, they are automatically declassified. That's a, That's a question that the Supreme Court has never decided. It has said that classifying documents for the first time, all of that power stems from the president. The president can declassify anything, but the Supreme Court has never said, oh, you have to do it a certain way, right? Like, you know, people, the prosecutors are going to say, oh, he has to keep a log and write it all down, document by document, but then say that anywhere in the constitution or any judicial opinion from the Supreme Court. So that's just one of the many issues that are easily, so even if this case followed the regular schedule and you got a courtroom proceeding going, gosh, about April, May, about a year from now, uh, the appeals that have to go to the Supreme Court, I mean, this case could be going on much longer than that, might run well into and indeed past the election. Yeah. And I suspect that it, it's certainly going to run past the election. It's not going to be resolved. And it's actually going to be part of the election. It is going to be part of, of the actual campaign of the former president and even maybe the current president. So it's going to be interesting to watch. John, you're always a wealth of knowledge. I appreciate you coming on. You you speak with such elegance when it comes to the Constitution. I appreciate that you focus on the Supreme Court because not a lot of people do. People tend to just you know throw out their opinions on what the court should do as opposed to actually understanding the Supreme Court and what the founding fathers had in mind. So I appreciate it. Oh, it was really great to come back. And I know the only way I can get on your show is by writing a book. So 
It, uh, you know, you I have take, an open I invitation. <laughs> you can come on I'm just whenever kidding. you want. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I only come a few years apart because it takes a long time to write these books. <laughs> it does, especially with the publishers and rewrites. And, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you have an open invitation here at the PAS. So anytime you want, you come right on. Well, it was really great to be with you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the chance to talk about this and talk about you know these. The way the Constitution is affecting these daily events, you know, that uh, who knew, who, who thought we'd ever live life through a time like this? Certainly not me, that's for sure. Everyone needs to check out John's book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court. I have links up at the PAS Report website, PASReport.com. Don't forget, if you found this episode informative, please leave a five-star rating and take 30 seconds to write a review on any podcast platform that allows it, including Apple Podcasts. I want to thank you for joining me. I will be back on Wednesday with another great episode of PAS Report Podcast. It's going to be a very important episode, so you're going to want to make sure you tune in. I want to thank you for joining me. Thank you for listening to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. Podcast. Have a good one. Bye. Be sure to rate, share, and subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss an episode. Also, visit PASReport.com and follow us on Twitter at PAS Report. Thank <laughs> you.